Today we're talking about three different methods and examples of self-talk, of speaking with your anima and self. We'll cover Carl Jung's method of self-talk, then King David's self-talk, and communication with his inner archetypes, his anima and or soul in Psalms. And last, but far from least, we'll cover Christ's version of individuation and his formula for individuation, which pairs perfectly with Carl Jung's self-talk and his stages of individuation, which borrow from the mysterious texts of the alchemists. The last section on Christ's Ask, Seek, Knock formula is pretty substantial, actually, but I'm going to go into much more detail on it in the next video. Anyhow, let's get to it. It helps to have a simple, practical formula, which interestingly enough comes from medieval alchemy and a lot of other sources, as well as Carl Jung, of course, and Christ's teaching on basically the metaphysical version of individuation or theosis. But before we cover the formula, let's answer this question. How do you communicate with the archetypes within? The idea here is to use Jung's method of active imagination, or Nikola Tesla's, whichever you prefer. See the link here and below for an in-depth guide on the subject. To speak with a specific part of the unconscious you. The anima. It can be as simple as asking yourself a question, directing the question to your anima, and then listening for the answer. If you have a creative sort of mind, you can also close your eyes and see your anima in your imagination with your mind's eye. That's what you're supposed to do. Jung had his patients personify their anima or animus as an autonomous personality and ask questions and then listen to the response. He said this about speaking with the anima. I mean this as an actual technique. The art of it consists only in allowing our invisible partner to make herself heard and putting the mechanism of expression momentarily at her disposal. Without being overcome by the distaste one naturally feels at playing such an apparently ludicrous game with oneself, or by doubts as to the genuineness of the voice of one's interlocutor. I have never heard that word. Interlocutor. 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 Interlocutor is how you say it, I guess. Interlocutor. You can find many examples of a similar sort of self-talk in the Bible. Here's an example from the ancient Israelite King David. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him my salvation. This is a depressed David searching his psyche and discovering a part of his soul that wasn't aligned with the highest mode of being. He asks his soul, Why are you cast down, O my soul? And then he proceeds with some encouraging self-talk. Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation. In this case, if David was using the active imagination technique, he would do his best to see the part of his psyche that he's trying to speak with in his mind's eye and would listen for the answer. And it's pretty much that simple. And it aligns with Christ's teaching on theosis, that is, bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth embodying the logos, becoming one with the highest. Through psychological lenses, that's embodying, enjoining your psyche wholly and completely with the highest state of being, the highest ideals, the highest values, virtues, etc. I'm not going to go too deeply on this right now because I'm going to cover this fully in the next video, but I want to give you Christ's formula which he gives the disciples immediately after teaching them to ask for the kingdom of God to come here on earth as it is in heaven, and a proverb on the subject. Again, this is theosis, deification, or basically Christ's version of individuation. And the formula he gives them is ask, seek, and knock. This formula is probably the best way to go after any form of success, but using it in the process of Carl Jung's version of self-talk and individuation as a whole for that matter is absolutely phenomenal. So step one is ask. Basically you're doing exactly that, you're asking. This works great with Jung's method of self-talk like I just said, at asking yourself or animo directly the question you need the answer to. 
But you can also ask your higher self, what Jung called the self, or the higher self, capital S, let's say, the Christ. Some will do this through strict psychological lenses, holding to the idea that Christ is merely an archetype, and some will address Christ fully believing that there is something more to him beyond the psychological. So like we discussed earlier, ask, and then stop and listen. If you get in the habit of doing David Goggins' mirror work, or whatever you want to call it, my suggestion is to add this step to that habit. Ask and listen. And like Christ says, you'll receive. This is a method Jordan Peterson does every day, by the way. This step has to do with receiving the answer that opens your eyes, which brings up the next step, what you do once your eyes are opened. Seek. Step two is seek. The point of this step is to go beyond the asking because you now have your answer. So let's say you asked, why don't people admire me or respect me or look up to me the way I think they should? Why do women not swoon over me the moment I walk in the room like I feel they should? Whatever it might be, and one of the many answers your higher self or your anima or Christ himself gives you is you're fat, out of shape, and lazy. Overcome your mind and get disciplined. Go to the gym. Get in shape. Use that process to harden your mind and become the strongest version of yourself. And there you go. You have your answer. Now that you have that answer, you have to seek Meaning, now that you've cast off the blinders and are no longer in the dark, your eyes have been opened by that first step of asking. So now you can use them. You have to seek out the solution to your answer. You have to use your eyes, both your physical eyes and your intuition, to determine how. One of your answers is basically, go to the gym. But how do you do that successfully? Using your eyes and instinct, you look for the specific methods that you can take action on. You read Arnold's new encyclopedia of modern bodybuilding or Brady's the TB12 method, I don't know. You start to see more gyms, gyms you never noticed before on your way to work. You watch Steve Cook videos or something, watching people who know what they're doing in the gym and discussing form, types of free weights and how to use them, workout plans and programs, etc. And now, because you used your eyes, the eyes in your head and the eyes of your mind, your imagination, your intuition, your instinct, you now have the specific methods that you can take action on. Which brings us to the final step, knock. I'll leave the details for a coming video, but I will say, this step is all about taking action. And not just any action, persistent action, relentless action. This is the step, the secret, the law of attraction, totally misses, or at least doesn't highlight enough as far as I can tell from those who make silly videos like effortlessly attract success, manifest money with ease. That's complete garbage. Because without this step, you're up a brown creek. No anchor, no paddle, no paper towels, nothing. This is why Christ dedicates an entire parable on persistence right after giving the disciples the true secret of prayer. So ask, seek, and knock. That is, Take persistent action on the action items you identified in step two. And that's the formula. The last thing I'll say about this formula, and again, I'll cover this in much more depth in the next video, along with Christ's version of individuation, which he calls bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth and sozo, amongst other things. Um, but the last thing is the reason Christ said, knock and the door will be opened. The reason he used the door is because the door is an ancient symbol that represents the waypoint between two realms or states of being. That which lies between one state of being and another. So I'll leave it at that for now. I wish I could point you to all the details right now, but we'll have to leave it for the next one. It's pretty detailed. That's all I have for this one. We'll take a much deeper dive next video, and I should have more practical examples for you as well. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe and ring the bell and everything, and I will see you in the next one. It definitely appears to me that the story of the passion is an archetypal and foretold tragic catastrophe. And I'll, I'll explain the foretold part later. So it's an archetypal catastrophe because it melds all the worst things that could happen to a person in their life. 
it is definitely a journey through all the worst things you could confront in your life. But then that's not enough, eh? Because there's the, there's the mythological cloud, let's say, around the narrative, because dying horribly and unjustly isn't enough. You also have to go to hell and, and harrow it. And so then, so that would mean that the ultimate extension of the human experience is not only the confrontation with malevolence and unjust death of the innocent, but a genuine journey into hell. Okay, then the question would be, and, and this is the sticker as far as I'm concerned, is isn't it the case that in your own life, Douglas, that the more deeply that you've peered into the abyss of things, the more likely it is that a light shines through it? And this, this is sort of the ultimate question of the resurrection is like, how do you revivify your faith in life? And the answer might be, it might really be by the radical acceptance of the malevolent tragedy of life. But even more than that, by the radical embracing of even the hellish aspect of life. And that if you did that radically enough, well, who knows what would happen? I mean, we know clinically, look, we know clinically if you find what people are avoiding and are afraid of and are disgusted by that's blocking their pathway forward, and you get them to confront that voluntarily. They get courageous and better. It's clearly the case, and it looks to me like the, the passion representation and its mythological substrate is exposure therapy on a cosmic level. And you, you know that the more deeply you grapple with the fundamental issues of life, the wiser and broader you get. And then I guess I would ask, if, if everyone did that to the utmost, what would it be that we might be able to conquer? And, like, and I don't know the answer to that. The life would radically transform. I mean, I see what happens because people write me all the time. I see what happens when people adopt a certain amount of responsibility for their life. I mean, they write and they say, man, everything's way better. And it's like, okay, how much better could it be? And, and this is also associated with this idea in the, in the New Testament. There's a, there's a section, I believe it's in the Sermon on the Mount, where Christ says it might not be, but he says that heaven will not emerge and all things will not manifest themselves till everyone brings everything inside them out right, their divine possibility, let's say, and that part of the reason that the world is fallen the way it is is because we hold back our best and we don't abide by the law and the prophetic spirit and we don't bring everything that's within us out into the world and the world is lesser as a consequence of that. And, and I do believe that we don't bring our best out because we're afraid and because we're desperate and because we don't have the courage to confront the malevolence and suffering and the hellish aspect of life. And so I do think, so you look at the death and you say, well, is the death more real and the hell more real or is the resurrection more real? And obviously in some sense, I'm speaking symbolically, but it seems to me, it's the same idea, you know, that it's an ancient mythological idea that you could go into the belly of the beast and rescue your father. And you know you're trying to do that with your book, The War on the West, right? It's like you see the assault on these values and you're attempting to resurrect those values. I see that as the same pattern. Yeah. Confession is nothing more than a listing of those things about yourself that you know you should shed and get rid of in the desire to return to something like a more pristine original state. And I think that state is associated with childhood and play, which is... There's an intimation in the New Testament, right, that unless you become as little children, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And that is a clearing away of all that traumatic catastrophe that's associated with maturation and a return to that playful and joyful spirit that so delightfully characterizes children, unconscious though they may be. You have to be aiming at something transcendent and eternal and and, and that contains the infinite in the finite, and why wouldn't that be incomprehensibly weird? And isn't it possible that the emphasis on phenomena like the virgin birth and the death and the resurrection and the word at the beginning of, the to of time and the sacrifice of the lamb aren't all part of that language that nails down the finite to the infinite in a way that isn't amenable to the mere disruption of reason? Like, music isn't amenable to the mere disruption of reason. 
It's got to be something like that, because look what we do in the cathedrals. They're stunningly beautiful. They take hundreds of years to build. They're full of music. They're full of strange practices and gothic symbolism and death. And it's very uncanny and strange, but it's not trivial. This idea of becoming one with the highest is what Jung also talks about from a purely psychological standpoint. Individuation is uniting with the archetype of the self and integrating everything that makes up the self. This means embodying the Logos, the Christ. That is, embodying everything that the Christ is. Logos, truth, faith, hope, love, the kingdom of God. The spirit, AKA Numa, which is closely associated with the spirit of Sophia in Proverbs and probably the same thing, which is wisdom. The Christ represents and is all these things. Jung says in Liber Novus, the Red Book, to be Christ oneself is the true following of Christ. In the Collected Works, volume 11, he writes, as the Logos, Son of the Father, Rex Gloriae, Judex Mundi, Redeemer and Savior, Christ is himself God, an all-embracing totality, which, like the definition of Godhead, is expressed iconographically by the circle or mandala and in his human manifestation he is the hero and god man born without sin more complete and more perfect than the natural man who is to him what a child is to an adult or an animal sheep to a human being he also says in the red book is there any one among you who believes he could be spared the way can he swindle his way past the pain of christ I say, such a one deceives himself to his own detriment. He beds down on thorns and fire. No one can be spared the way of Christ, since this way leads to what is to come. You should all become Christ's. So, Jung said that the goal of the individuation process is the synthesis of the self. And the Christ is the archetype of the self. But what does the archetype of Christ consist of? What needs to be synthesized? And this is where the two paths, while they're very similar in many ways, they part to a degree. Christ has his methods, which are incredible, but his methods differ a bit from Jung's approach, which is also incredible. Uh, 